Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and welcome to this worship service on the Vine, the online campus of the Wrightsville United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you've joined us today for this second Sunday of Advent service and it's a special service because being the first Sunday of the month, we're also observing Holy Communion today. And so I'll just give you a heads up that if you don't already have bread and juice or other common liquid, uh, you might want to grab that now uh, so that you'll be ready when the time comes. And you'll also have another opportunity later on. Also, be sure and sign in. We'd love to know who's watching each week. And there'll be a QR code that you can scan and we'll take you to a link. Or there should be a link in the video description. And you can click on that. You can not only register your attendance, but you can also make us aware of any prayer concerns that you might have. We're so glad that you've joined us for this worship service during this Advent season as we anticipate the coming of the Christ child at Christmas. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds for the worship of our God.
I invite you now to join with me in praying together our opening prayer. Uh, You will find the words uh, scrolling across your screen as we pray. Let us pray together. Almighty God, you have taught us that the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Grant that we may always be found watching for the coming of your Son. You so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Help us to feel your presence with us always. And may our lives show in every word and deed your great love for the world. We confess that we are not always willing to see the light and to walk in your ways. We ask that the Spirit of Christ be born anew within us, that our hearts may be stirred to glorify the birth of Jesus with words of witness and acts of compassion and service. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Isaiah 9, verses 6 through 7. For a child has been born to us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time and onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. We light this candle as a symbol of the Prince of Peace. May the visitation of your Holy Spirit, O God, make us ready for the coming of Jesus, our hope and joy. O come, O come, Emmanuel.
Hi, I'm Doug Lane, senior pastor here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church, and I'd now like to invite you to join me in prayer. Merciful God, you sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation. Give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins. Travel with us this Advent morning. Guide us through the wilderness of our minds so that we might focus on you. Bring the mountains of our egos and the valleys of our depressions to a level land. Straighten our beliefs so that our actions might smooth out the rough roads we encounter. Help us in this time of waiting and preparation and come quickly to touch our lives, especially the lives of those whom we name before you now. God of the ages, we praise you for sending light to dispel the darkness. In Jesus, you began a new creation and sent him to be the light of the world in order to drive away fear and despair and to rule in peace and justice, holiness and love. Help us now to share in his ministry and to be agents of his compassion to the world around us as we pray the prayer that he first taught his disciples by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I want to remind you of ways that you can participate in the life of the church, and of course, some of those are through offerings uh, to the church in order to continue the ministries uh, that we do here and in this community and around the world. Um, you can write a check to Wrightsville United Methodist Church, Post Office Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina, 28480. You can also um, go to our website, wrightsvilleumc.org, or give through our app that's on uh, your mobile phone device. Um, thank you for participating, and thank you for giving your offering in the name of Jesus Christ.
Hey everybody, it's now time for the children's sermon. So if there are any kids around, now's a great time to come over to the television. I'd love to have a moment to worship with you. Hey boys and girls, good to see you today. I hope you're having a great, great week as we move into the month of December. This is also a new month in the Christian year. It's not called December, it's not called winter or fall, it's called Advent. Advent means that we are preparing for the coming of Jesus, right? And when does Jesus come? At Christmas. Yeah, I know, everybody's so excited about Christmas. I get excited about Advent just because it means we're getting closer. Well, one of the people who talked about Jesus coming was a prophet named Isaiah. And Pastor Julia is going to share more about Isaiah in a few minutes. But I wanted to take a minute to explain what a prophet is. Have you ever heard that word before? Prophet? Prophet. P-R-O-P-H-E-T. Kind of a funny word. Prophet. Prophet. Sometimes people think of a prophet as like a, a fortune teller who can tell the future. Um, and prophets sometimes do tell the future. But the main job of the prophet is to speak the word of God to God's people. Okay? Can you say that with me? To speak the word of God to God's people. Speak the word of God to God's people. That is the role of the prophet. Now, there's a different leader um, way back in Old Testament times uh, that's kind of related to the prophet, and that is the priest. The priest speaks to God on behalf of God's people. Okay, so they have kind of the, the exact opposite motion. So the prophet speaks for God to God's people. The priest speaks to, for the people back to God. Now, how does one do that? A prophet, that makes sense. They probably preach and proclaim God's word. What does a priest do? Well, how, does, how do they speak on behalf of God's people back to God? Well, one of the ways is through our offering. Um, that's a way that we give back to God. That is a priestly thing to do. So we've got a prophet and we've got a priest. The prophet speaks for God to God's people. The priest speaks for the people back to God. But there's a third leader in the Bible, a third type of leader. We've got a prophet, we've got a priest, and we also have, can you think what it might be, a different kind of leader in the Bible? It's a king, a king. Now, a king you're probably familiar with, right, from fairy tales and from Disney movies. A king is a ruler over a group of people, okay? So the prophet speaks for God to God's people. The priest speaks for the people back to God. And the king is the ruler over a group of people, okay? Does that make sense? We've got a prophet, a priest, and a king. But I'm going to give you a, a big question. Which one do you think Jesus was? Was he a prophet? Was he a priest? Was he a king? Did he speak on behalf of God to God's people? Did he speak for the people on, back to God? Or did he rule over a group of people? Which one is Jesus? You know what? He's all three. He does speak on behalf of God to God's people. He does speak to the people back to God by taking away our sins. And he rules over us all. He is our Lord. He is our King. He is the one that we follow, right? So he's all three. He has all three types of biblical leadership. That's our Jesus. And so whenever you hear those words, prophet, priest, or king, I want you to remember that Jesus was all three. All right? Let's pray about that. Holy God, thank you for sending us Jesus, who speaks for you, who speaks for us, and who rules over our hearts. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thanks, boys and girls. Have a great week.
Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Pastor Julia Hayes. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to get to bring you our scripture passage this morning. Our passage comes to us from the book of Isaiah, chapter 11, beginning in verse 1. A shoot shall come out from the stalk of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breadth of his lip he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fat lane together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the wean child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you join me now in prayer? Holy and loving God, we are hungry today to hear a word from you. Lord, I ask that in this time you would use me to speak a word to your people. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Last week, I was home with my family in Ohio for Thanksgiving. And on Wednesday, I got to do something incredibly fun. My mom, my sister, my cousin, and I all went over to my grandma's house, and we had an awesome afternoon playing Hallmark Christmas movie bingo. If you are familiar with Hallmark Christmas movies, you understand how this could work. There's certain elements that are in just about every single one of these movies. So as we watched, we shouted out the things that we saw. They're wrapping presents. They're baking cookies. They're decorating a tree. It's snowing. I saw Christmas lights. When it comes to Hallmark movies, if you've seen one, you've pretty much seen them all. In fact, I keep seeing around Facebook this picture that shows every Hallmark Christmas release of the season. And in every single promotional photo for every single movie, there is some gorgeous 20 or 30 something woman wearing a red outfit, standing next to an equally handsome young man wearing a green sweater. It's easy to play bingo with these movies because they all pretty much look the same and they all follow the same basic plot. But for people who love these movies, that predictability is part of the appeal. Once I overheard my grandma talking about the joy of Hallmark movies, she said, at the end, they always kiss and then it starts snowing. But of course, Hallmark movies have their critics. For every person who is delighted by the movies, there is somewhere a curmudgeon or a sullen teenager who points out that that's not how real life works. People don't act that way. Love usually ends, and it doesn't snow on Christmas when you live in coastal North Carolina. Our passage today was most likely met with equal numbers of skeptics. Our scripture today comes from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet who lived in the 8th century BC. A lot of prophets were outsiders who critiqued their society and their rulers from the margins of society. But Isaiah was more of an insider. He had the ear of Israel's leaders. At the time when Isaiah received these visions from God, Isaiah, Israel was in a tough place. 
Israel was feeling threatened by the Assyrian Empire, which was gaining power and influence. It's never a good thing to have a rapidly expanding empire as your neighbor. The visions that Isaiah saw are sometimes words of warning and sometimes words of hope. This vision is one of hope. It's a promise of better things on the horizon. The vision has two main parts and both are about God's reign. First, we see the reign of God enacted through a new ruler in Israel, a king who will rule with righteousness and with justice. This king comes from the line of Jesse, who was King David's father. So this future ruler is a part of the dynasty of kings who God promised would always rule Israel. Isaiah says about this leader, the spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That's a tall order. A look at our latest election cycle shows how hard it can be to find a leader with wisdom and understanding, counsel and might and knowledge, and much less the fear of the Lord. Not only that, but some scholars argue that this prophecy was actually not fully written down until the 6th century BC, when the Israelites were in Babylonian captivity. At that point in history, the Davidic monarchy had been defeated. The temple was burned to the ground. There wasn't a descendant of David on the throne because there wasn't a throne left at all. That's why our passage says that a shoot shall come up out of the stump of Jesse. Only a stump remains because the tree has been cut down by Babylon. Then Isaiah paints a picture of the natural world without any violence whatsoever. He says, the wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The first part of the vision was unlikely, but this is downright ridiculous. Imagine to the zoo, going to the zoo and hearing, we've decided to reorganize the exhibits. We've decided to combine the petting zoo with the wolves and the big cats. So now the sheep, goats, and cows will all be in the same enclosure as the lions, leopards, and wolves. But don't worry, we've taken one of the elementary school kids away from her field trip and made her the zookeeper. So she's there to make sure that all of this goes smoothly. You would have to be nuts to think that that was a good idea. No part of this prophecy seemed achievable. Can you imagine what it must have been like to hear these words proclaimed with hope over and over and over while your life didn't change? How could you hear, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, when there is violence around you every day? How could you hear, with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth, when all you see around you are crooked, corrupt politicians? I wonder if maybe it got to the point where hearing these words read again felt like Yet another movie where the couple kisses at the end and then the snow starts falling. Sure, it's a nice idea, but real life just doesn't work like that. But here's the thing. God keeps God's promises. Period. Full stop. And yet at the same time, the fulfillment of those promises often looks very different from what we might have expected. 800 years after Isaiah received this promise, the promise of a shoot springing up from the stump of Jesse, another promise was made. This promise came not to a prophet with the ear of royalty, but to a teenage girl from backwoods Galilee, 
who was engaged to a distant descendant of King David. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. Jesus is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. But Jesus isn't what anyone would have expected. When Isaiah wrote these words, his hope was for a literal human king to be this great ruler. The king was supposed to be an ideal leader to protect the Israelites from the Assyrians, someone who could return Israel to its former greatness. Instead, Jesus comes as a baby, 700 years after the prophecy, and he refuses to be a king in the political sense. In fact, after Jesus fed the 5,000, the Gospel of John says that the people tried to make him their king by force, and instead of letting them, Jesus hid. Jesus is the promised king in a truer, deeper, realer way than anyone would have expected. And yet I believe that there might have been some who would have seen Jesus and not recognized him as the fulfillment of all, and would have continued to believe that God had just left them out in the cold. In our world, we often associate hope with naivete. We think we only have two options, to be optimists or to be realists. In this dichotomy, optimists are those who always see the bright side, who refuse to acknowledge the deep pain in the world in favor of platitudes and rainbows and sparkles. On the other side, realists are those who see nothing but the darkness, who won't get their hopes up because they know the evil that's in the world. But as Christians, we are neither optimists nor realists. We are something else entirely. You see, if Jesus was merely an optimist, he would not have believed that the cross was necessary. But if Jesus were merely a realist, there would be no resurrection. So following Jesus, we are neither optimists nor realists. We are people of hope. Christian hope looks evil squarely in the eyes and then declares that evil does not get the final word. My maternal grandfather died about two years ago, but before his death, he and I developed a special relationship. He had been an Episcopal priest and he was so excited that I was going into ministry as well. In the years before his death, he began to pass on his mantle to me in some very literal ways. Many of the books that are on the shelf in my office are ones that originally belonged to him. And he's even given me his own stoles to wear when I'm ordained. Perhaps most precious to me, though, is a notebook where he wrote down his thoughts to share with me. It's filled with stories and jokes and all of his various theological musings. My favorite page is one that's blank, except for one line. The age of miracles is not yet over. My grandfather was an Episcopal priest, a social worker, and a volunteer hospital chaplain. His ministry included being fired from his parish when he wouldn't be silent about racial injustice in the 1960s. It included counseling couples as they realized that the only way to go forward was to go apart. It included hours upon hours spent with the sick, the dying, and the grieving in the hospital. If someone should have ended up jaded and disappointed, it was him. He knew the pain in the world. 
And yet, at the end of his life, he was not jaded. He was more convinced than ever of God's work in the world. His advice to me was not manage your expectations, prepare to spend your life working with difficult people and sifting through church bureaucracy. Instead, he reminded me to keep my eyes peeled for God's movement, to never stop anticipating miracles. And in that way, he was much like the prophet Isaiah. The age of miracles is not yet over. During the Advent season, this is the truth that we proclaim. God's work is not done. Jesus has come and yet we await his second coming. The age of miracles is not yet over. When you're watching a Hallmark movie, you know it isn't over until the couple has kissed and the snow starts to fall. And in our story, we know it isn't the end because it won't be the end until every tear is wiped from our eyes and death has been destroyed and we see God face to face. The age of miracles is not yet over. Alleluia. Alleluia. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you that you never let a promise go unfulfilled. Lord, would you help us to trust you more than we trust what we think success would look like? Lord, mold us into people of Advent hope. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We continue our service with Holy Communion. If you have not already um, taken a moment to get some bread and some juice, then I invite you now to stop the video and go ahead and get that and then come back and join us. Join me now in the confession. Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you now to take a moment to pray in silence. Now hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, and also with, with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift them up to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, 
whom you sent in the fullness of time to be a light to the nations. You scatter the proud in the imagination of their hearts and have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You put down the mighty from their thrones and exalt those of low degree. You fill the hungry with good things and the rich you send away empty. Your own son came among us as a servant to be Emmanuel, your presence with us. He humbled himself in obedience to your will and freely accepted death on a cross. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, he gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by His blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Wherever you are gathering with us today, remember that this meal that we share reminds us that the bread which we partake is a sharing in the body of Christ, And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. I invite you now to partake of this holy meal. Friends, go today in the hope that the age of miracles is not yet over. 
And as you go, may the spirit of the living God made known to us most fully in Jesus Christ, our Lord, go before you to show you the way, go behind you to push you into places you might not go on your own, go above you to watch over you and protect you, go beneath you to lift you up when you cannot stand, go beside you to be your companion and dwell within you to remind you every day that you are not alone and that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination. Go in peace. May you run and not be weary. May your heart be filled with song. May the love of God continue to give you hope and keep you strong. And may you run and not be weary. May your life be filled with joy. And may the road you travel always lead you home.